Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my very special guest, Andre Gagné, professor in theological studies at Concordia University in Montreal. Andre, it's very good to have you. I'm so excited today to have you on the show. I have wanted to do this forever, but I'll be honest, your research is so, at the time I was studying it, it was so complicated. I wanted to wrap my head around it so I didn't look like a fool when, <laughs> when I had you on the show to talk. But um, you expose me to the world of the NAR and how Laterane connected to it. And you were one of the first people that I heard mention William Branham's name in all of that research. Um, Stephen Hassan, Dr. Stephen Hassan connected us years ago. I don't even remember what year that was. And I was digesting your videos one after another after another. But for the people who are on the video podcast, I'll throw the link up and you guys will just Mm -hmm. go nuts with all of the research that Andre has. But um, so excited to have you today. Maybe you could just tell a little bit about yourself and um, wanted to have a casual conversation of where this podcast is headed this year. Yes, thank you so much, John. I've, uh, you know, I've, uh, I'm so happy that we are finally meeting, finally talking, and it really warms my heart that, uh, you know, the work that I've been doing for the past couple of years has been useful for you somehow. And I'm sure that it's uh, propelled you to even more in-depth work on uh, your interests and I'm extremely honored and happy to be here. It's it's great, uh, really. Um, and like you said, uh, maybe I can say just a few words about myself. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm uh, a full professor in theological studies at Concordia University in Montreal. So uh, I'm a bit of an outsider when it you know when it comes to things <laughs> about American <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> politics and theology. <laughs> Um, and I've you know, just re- recently released a, a book, uh, as you know, American Evangelicals for Trump, Dominion, Spiritual Warfare and the End Times. And uh, yeah, I've been uh, I've been very much, uh, you know, my my initial training, actually, as as a uh, as an academic has been in in biblical studies. So uh, I've you know, I've been I, I, I did my B.A., M.A., Ph.D., uh, in biblical studies, trying to understand and wrestle with, you know, historical questions about the Bible. Where did the Bible come from? How did it originate? Who wrote it? Why are there tensions in, in scripture and things like that? And at one point in my journey, and eventually I became an academic and, you know, became a professor. But uh, at one point, we also ask ourselves uh, questions pertaining to our own research. How can our own research be useful somehow, because we can be very much buried in our own interests about, you know, exegesis and original languages and left and right (laughs) studying manuscripts. But uh, sometimes it's, it's hard for people that are not in that world to actually connect with what you're doing. So um, this is when I started, uh, you know, being interested in how people were reading the Bible today how you know christians were were reinterpreting scripture and applying it to their particular context sometimes using it in a legitimate in a legitimate way but sometimes misusing and uh you know abusing scripture and hurting themselves and their loved ones in a very profound way and uh, of course this brought me eventually to uh, the issue of evangelicalism uh and evangelicals in the context of American politics, uh, of course, there were you know their 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 infatuation, I would say, with with Donald Trump, and all the biblical language and justifications that surrounded that. Um, did a lot of work around the New Apostolic Reformation, as you know, the NAR, uh, Neo Charismatic Pentecostals. The, again, their their worldview, ideas around uh, spiritual warfare, notions of dominion, and so on. So for me, uh, it's really about, of course, we do have research interests, but it's also showing how those research interests really tie in with, you know, what 
people are experiencing in their lives. And uh, I think, you know, the past couple of years, I, this is what I, I tried to do. Well, it is certainly amazing. <clears throat> Very amazing. You know, whenever I first began this journey for myself, I, I can't even remember if you were before the new website or after. I had The cult actually attacked my YouTube site and brought it down years ago. Oh, um, my. It, it might have been the old one, in fact, that you that whenever I was connected with mm-hmm. you. But <clears throat> anyway, anybody who has studied my progression as I'm going down this journey, it's all over the place, man, because in the early <laughs> days I was studying the theology and I was trying to research and document it. And then I went into the, you know, kind of the esoteric world because we were in a, a religion that was based on very esoteric premises and I was trying to piece together well, why is that it doesn't make sense it's when I realized what Christianity was you know after we left and started going to new churches once I once I realized that what they were teaching wasn't even really compatible with Christianity I began mm-hmm. to ask the question well what was this and <clears throat> that got me into studying the history so I could uncover how it began and um, right before right before we started this podcast, I told you that I was going to save all the <laughs> save all the, the big explosive secrets for the podcast. So I could see your face. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, we we have reached a point where, honestly, and to the listeners who can see me bubbling up with excitement, mm. all of these different pieces were just kind of scattered pieces, did not go together at all. But as I'm researching and and using the research of others, your research was kind of the glue that bound it all together. And once I started understanding what it was that you were saying and understanding all these many different pieces, Mm -hmm. suddenly I realized that the theme that we're heading towards this year is weaponized religion, because Mm. that is what we came out of. And... Once I connected it to, I understood British Israelism, how it developed. Once I connected the leaders of Latter Rain directly to the Christian identity movement, speaking at conferences that were Christian identity, I began to understand that there was a political aspect to it. And so I started diving into, like you said, the evangelicals and politics. Mm -hmm. I did this before they were even called evangelicals. Mm -hmm. I started studying the populist movement. How did it begin and grow? And there were key names, which some of those you may know, some you may Mm -hmm. not, but Gerald Burton Winrod, who was a, he was somewhat of a father to the Christian identity movement. He was spreading the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, which was the Jewish Mm -hmm. propaganda. Mm -hmm. He was spreading it all throughout the United States. And he had audience directly with leaders in Nazi Germany. And right after connecting with them, suddenly he's got all this money, he's coming to the United States, and he's spreading propaganda through a religious platform. Well, he was on the board of directors for the National Fundamentalist League in the United States. One of those directors was Roy E. Davis, who mm. was basically the mentor. He's the one who planted my grandfather's church. Roy oh, E. Davis wow. was the second in command of the 1915 Ku Klux Klan. He worked directly under William Joseph Simmons, who was the founder of the 1915 mm. Klan. Mm-hmm. When the Klan separated, when it <clears throat> when it exploded into all of these various underground you know, hidden clan sects. And it there's a period of time in which the clan was thriving in Indiana after this. There was one man who helped or tried to, you know, defend the clan in Washington, who is named Congressman William D. Upshaw. He worked closely with Roy Davis, who was the guy who planted mm-hmm. my grandfather's church. church, church. These two figures were deeply involved with William Branham. And I started connecting all these dots, and and I could spout off like 50 other names that are like this. But they were developing what eventually ended up to be the first iteration of what was called the America First Party. There was a man in Indianapolis at the height of the Indiana clan named Gerald L. K. Smith who founded the Christian First Party. 
he right after the Klan was exposed in Indiana, he went down to Shreveport and worked directly with the people on the ministerial board with the father-in-law of Jack Moore, who was mm. basically the guy mm. who started William Branham's yeah. organization yeah. there in Shreveport, right? Yeah. Yeah. L.K. Smith, he ran for president, didn't succeed, but he moved to California at the same time that Roy Davis and Congressman Upshaw, the guy I mentioned before, mm -hmm. moved, they moved out to California as well, began silently funding to grow the third wave of the Ku Klux Klan. L.K. Smith became the Imperial Wizard of the California Klan, and under him was Wesley A. Swift, his second in command, and he is the notorious the most notorious Christian identity figure in the nation, in nation's history. From, mm. from Swift, you birthed the neo-Nazis, the Aryan nations, all of these weird political sects that came out. And it came directly from this guy who's connected to Laterain. And yeah. I, this was a name I'd never heard of. And in fact, I think it was only last year I began to realize that, wait a minute, William Branham, who was our prophet in this cult mm -hmm. I escaped, mm -hmm. he is claiming to have all these divine revelations of mm -hmm. the ma the serpent seed, for example. Yeah. And, you know, these, yeah. these doctrines that are white supremacy yeah. doctrines. Yeah. Well, I, I did not realize it, but he is simply rebranding the content from Wesley Swift, giving a different name. In his serpent seed, he took out the names black or the words black and Jew. But he gives he gives the same historical lineage that Swift used. So anybody who understands that, you know, the lineage that he's talking about, they understands mm -hmm. that he is talking about That's the black it, yeah. people, right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but he's rebranded Swift's, you know, theology and even to the extent Swift's um, celestial bodies theology. That's something I grew up with. Swift's um, UFO theology. I grew up with this. And mm. I started realizing, wait a minute, Wesley Swift was, he was working closely with these guys, if not the parent mm. to what William Branham was bringing as theology. This is phenomenal. <laughs> this is kind of mind blowing <laughs> because you've done really <laughs> profound genealogical historical work. And, and this is important, you know, making those connections between topics and themes and how these are rebranded because this is constantly what we're seeing you know speaking of any kind of uh, ideas that emerged for example out of the early pentecostal movement you know they use terms they use expressions these eventually get picked up but rebranded in another way and then you end up later on through you know the, of course you have the healing revivals in in the 40s and 50s and then your charismatic movement in the 60s and then the the kind of third wave and what we see with the nar but a lot of these ideas are constantly going through some form of rebranding but at the core it's what you're saying you see at the core a lot of it is about white supremacy and when i think about what you're saying in terms of um, even notions of uh, you know ideas of the serpent seed uh, that we find in Bre in brenham for example but these are ideas that you found that, that that can be found also very early on with people like charles parham who is at really the, because when we, we, we talk about early Pentecostalism, let's say in the context of American, uh, of American society, uh, of course we can talk about different, uh, I would say, uh, uh, genetic uh, origins of Pentecostalism ac across the world. But you know, when we talk about pe Pentecostalism, often we, we, we tie it to a Sousa Street, 1906 with uh, J. William Seymour, uh, but we often forget Charles Parham, who actually at first is the one that really emphasized the idea of the this idea of baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He actually experienced that earlier than Azusa Street. But Parham was a racist. You see, Parham's lineage 
and heritage or legacy is one of racism out of which a lot of people are not are, are often forgetting is that you have out of the parham lineage the largest pentecostal assembly uh, you know the largest pentecostal uh, denomination in the world the assemblies of god this is parham's lineage when parham when parham talks about for example even ideas of speaking in tongues he understands this in the context of last days world evangelism that he has and his group has received this gift to go and preach to the heathens of other countries, uh, especially black people in other countries, so that they could be exposed to the light of the gospel and maybe be saved, <laughs> you know, and maybe be saved. So, um, so you have a form of... Um, he had even a, a kind of a, a theology of uh, uh, of creation that evaluated, like there was a first creation and a second creation, and that second creation was was tied to Cain. It's very very similar to what you find in in Brenham's own view of the serpent seed, but it was it was spelled out a bit differently with Parham. So you see these ideas are constantly rebranded. And, and when you had the spectacular move uh, of uh, Azusa Street under William Seymour, who was a, 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 an African-American, uh, and he was the pastor of, the, of this church, and he had been, what's very interesting, he had been a disciple of Parham, but started, you know, left Parham at one point, decided to go to Los Angeles, beginning his own church, and it was a, a mixed race church. When Parham discovered this, he started accusing Seymour of stealing his idea because Seymour has been popular, you see? So what you see in American, like American Pentecostalism and the way that people want to talk about that history of American Pentecostalism, there is a willingly, um, there was a willingness to throw aside the Parham lineage and stick to the William Seymour lineage because it's the best <laughs> it's the it's it's the most uh, positive, less <laughs> racist lineage. But in in reality, you know the the founder, the 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 originator of what we understand Pentecostalism to be was was, was Charles Parham. You see, so so it's very interesting the this this notion of labeling. Um, and and rebranding because this is something that co constantly happens in these types of movements because you know they can't reinvent the wheel. What they'll do is they'll take what's existent and adapt it and try to make it more uh, uh, more acceptable. And, and and it's it's a bit deceitful because in the end, when you do the work you do, for example, when you scratch the surface and you go deeper, like the kind of work that you've been doing. This is, you know, all the dirt that you're uncovering is is quite traumatic, I, I, I should say. Yeah, and the dirt has been swept under the rug. <laughs> you know what I yes. mean? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's really unbelievable. You know, I think you were one of the first people that I heard that Parham was a racist. I, I, I want to mm. say it was you. If not, it was somebody shortly after I came in contact with your research. Mm. But <clears throat> when I heard this, I thought, no, man, because I came out of this religion <laughs> that I thought was somehow linked to Pentecostalism. And yeah, yeah. even even that of, in itself is absurd now that now knowing the history and having dug through it. Yeah. <clears throat> There's yeah. some other things that I've not I've not had this conversation with you since we spoke last, but you know William Branham, when he entered into the Latter Rain revivals, he posed mm -hmm. as a Baptist minister claiming to yeah. have got the Holy Ghost and stumbled onto it by accident. And every mm -hmm. single biography that you find of William Branham will say this. They'll say he was a Baptist minister that converted. Yeah. And yeah. they they will tell you he had these series of prophecies in 1933, and that's what made him famous. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. E even on my grandfather's church, there's this there's this concrete inset that says dedicated in 1933. Well, when we went when we went to the courthouse and pulled the deed, the deed to the building is 1936. And so I'm scratching my head and wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. So I spent 
I can't tell you how many thousands of hours going through microfish. I went through every newspaper that existed. And in this area, believe it or not, there was a lot of newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the Louisville side of the river, you had, you know, I, I went to the Louisville Library, and they've got just mm -hmm. rows and rows of microfish. Went through mm -hmm. the Jeffersonville, Indiana Library. <clears throat> well, when I started putting together everything into a timeline, I realized that in 1933, Branham was still in Davis's church, which was advertised as Pentecostal. And oh. it, it was really odd. So, I, but it was it was advertised as Pentecostal Baptist, and I'm I'm thinking, what is this? Mm -hmm. One of the big things that came out, it's either two years ago or maybe last year, we found this. Roy Davis, who was Branham's mentor, the Klan guy, he was coming into Indiana right after the fall of D.C. Stevenson, which was the head of the Indiana Klan. He. He was arrested for, I can't remember the lady's name, but cannibalization and sexual molestation, oh, all, all kinds of weird oh, stuff. He goes to prison. <clears throat> what left a void in leadership. And so Davis comes into this area during the void in leadership, and he's in the same faction of Klan. So he's poised to become a leader. He didn't, but he was poised to. He got, <laughs> he was in criminal suits of himself, and he went to prison, so he lost his chance at leadership <clears throat> but there was a pentecostal very well respected pentecostal man named gt haywood and haywood was in indianapolis at a time when it was the largest clan in the united states everybody was you know there were people who weren't even racist who were part of the clan because it was the in thing to do in indiana mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. haywood was having interracial revivals which the Klan leadership doesn't like this, right? No, of course not. And he published this tract called Victim of the Flaming Sword, which was highly popular, spread through all, all throughout the nation. I wish I'd have brought it out. I've actually got a mm. copy of mm. one of the old tattered versions of it in my mm. library. He published this tract, Victim of the Flaming Sword. Roy Davis and William Simmons, the two guys that were mm. you know, created the Klan, mm -hmm. when, they're, when that part of the Klan imploded, they created a new white supremacy group in opposition to Haywood called the Knights of the Flaming Sword. And they were hmm. going to grow it. It was to become a replacement for the Klan, but it imploded after they, the financial schemes were uncovered. And hmm. <clears throat> Davis fled the state, comes to through Louisville, then to Indiana. Hmm. But when he came, he created a new Pentecostal sect called the Pentecostal Baptist Church of God. And mm. he, was, he was the general overseer of this sect. We can place William Branham at revivals with Caleb Ridley, the Imperial Clud, which is the Imperial Supreme, Supreme Chaplain mm -hmm. of the Klan. Um, Roy Davis, who was the, the Klan guy, William Branham was there in, mm. Memphis, or in uh, Nashville, Tennessee in 1929 so Branham was working with the Pentecostals as early as 19 in the 1920s so then okay. they come to they come to Jeffersonville they plant the Jeffersonville church <clears throat> and all this to say whenever Branham gives these fabulous fictional life stories about mm -hmm. how he was a mm -hmm. Baptist and he was in mm -hmm. Mishawaka, stumbled onto this revival mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. became a ba became a Pentecostal, you know. I have a friend who's another researcher who f identified what church that was at and I went and visited the church and went through their archives and we pieced together through newspapers, their archives, their newsletters that it looks very much like they were attempting before the UPCI to build a sect that could be included in the UPCI. And they were working very closely with men who did become UPCI leaders. But the revivalists that were coming to this area in Jeffersonville, while Branham was in a Pentecostal church, he was a one of the, you know, he's a bishop right under the, mm -hmm. right under the leader of this. Mm. He's working with people in that church before he even goes to this alleged accidental encounter of Pentecostalism. Mm. So he's a Pentecostal mm. leader in a Pentecostal church, 
And yeah. all of this is happening before even his church is planted, but the dates don't line up. He's <laughs> the church doesn't exist yet, that the one that's supposed to be dedicated mm-hmm. 1933, and he's holding these revivals with the clan guys in 1933. All of this to say once I realized that there was a threat of racism embedded in Pentecostalism through these guys, it made me want to dig mm-hmm. deeper and see, okay, maybe you're right. Let's investigate Parham. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And and the fact that, you know, because you're absolutely right, if you read any biography, whatever, on, Par- uh, on, on, on Brenham, he's an independent Baptist, <laughs> supposedly independent Baptist. Um, so it so when you come across what you've discovered like baptist pentecostal uh that it doesn't jive at least with the 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 information that we find in a lot of these uh uh, academic scholarly uh uh, biographies but it's not surprising in, in the sense that you could also have the connection of baptist pentecostals because there were very early on uh, uh, an opening on the part of Baptists to the move of the Spirit. So, in a sense, it makes sense at the same time. It, the, the, the information is erroneous in terms of he's not an independent Baptist, maybe not, and probably not, but being a Baptist Pentecostal, that could be a possibility because there's, there's this openness amongst Baptists, even in the late 19th century, to the idea of, you know, embracing gifts of the Spirit and and even uh, experiencing some of these, you know, gifts that are more supernaturally oriented somehow. So... It's interesting because I, I didn't know this, like, uh, because we always rely on, you know, these people that go and uh, a, a lot of them do research and supposedly they go in the archives and they go to places and they visit the actual place. But uh, so I, I'm pleasantly surprised, but it does explain a lot of things in oh, yeah. terms of his idea of being connected and, ha- and having even an openness. Because if you're a, if you're a hardcore Baptist, you're not going to even consider that as a possibility. And, and you have it in some testimonies. You know, during the, the, the healing revival years, you have these Baptists that are discovering who Brenham is. You know, they encounter him through his ministry. And, oh, I'm a hardcore Baptist. And, I, you know, I, I wasn't open to the spirit gifts and all of that. And, and eventually they do open themselves up. But it's very revealing that they're saying very clearly that their stance is not about the operation of the of, of the gifts of the spirit. Um, you were mentioning something, uh, the connection, like when you re- like when you led uh, you 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 explored the podcasts that that I or the vlogs that I was doing uh, around latter rain, and and you saw this connection uh, with with Brennan. Uh, what what specifically? Um, stood out in terms of how latter rain people functioned at least those that came out from uh north battlesford eh, in in saskatchewan people like uh, the houghtons for example who had visited who had been very much influenced by uh uh, um, Brenham's uh, crusade, uh, his his uh, his time in in Vancouver. They went. Uh, a bunch of people went to see Brenham there. It came back. They were all excited with what had happened in Vancouver, and they want to kind of bring the revival back to North Battlesford. So uh, when you were when you were kind of listening to this stuff, what what caught your attention with what you knew about Brenham and what you saw? I'm a bit intrigued about that with with Lateran people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so th- this is where you can laugh at me, right? <clears throat> we were <laughs> no, no. we were um, what's the word? I'm trying to think of a nice way to label myself, but other than just outright saying we were brainwashed, <laughs> we were in this <laughs> we were in this thing under mind control, and <clears throat> I. To be real honest, I had no idea Brandon mm-hmm. was connected to Latter Rain. In mm-hmm. fact, if you go listen to his recordings, which 
as a child, I listened to these recordings in my car. Uh, you know, we, we would travel with them. I listened mm-hmm. to them at my bedtime, mm-hmm. bedside stand, mm-hmm. had a little Walkman that I would go through oh, school yeah. at work. You know, I listened to these things to where I could quote them almost as much as I can now quote the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> so <laughs> I, and there, towards the later years when Branham was being you know Branham was ousted by the assemblies of god and yeah, he, yeah, he was yeah. um you, you know all that history well he yeah, yeah. as people would separate with him he would denounce them and part of mm. the people he denounced were the Lateran people and mm. we were taught we were conditioned to think of it as one solid unified from 1947, which is the earliest tape we have access mm-hmm. to here, mm-hmm. to 1965, one unified message that is thematically the same. So if he denounced Latter Rain, we have to believe he always denounced yeah. Latter Rain. Okay. <clears throat> now there were there were the splintered into many splinter groups. So some splinter mm-hmm. groups did understand this. <clears throat> yeah. But where it got really really interesting is once I realized from you that. No, he is not only connected to Ladder Rain, he's one of the two catalysts that created Ladder Rain. Yeah. I think that's what I really picked up from you was that mm. Ladder Rain could not have existed without Branham. It it mm. really for it to have developed, it, there yeah. had to be a Branham, yeah. right? Yeah. So I yeah. wanted to know why. And you know, <clears throat> as I'm going through Pentecostalism, like you said, Parham mm-hmm. Parham mm. is for me, he's one of the founders, but I actually go back before Parham. I went deeply into study, okay, what made Parham? So Parham goes, mm. as you know, on the tour to see um, John Alexander Dowie and Zion, yeah, yeah, you know, for example, yeah, Frank Frank yeah. Parham, or Frank Sanford. <clears throat> so yeah. I am, I'm beginning to, as I'm formulating all these pieces, which is leading to this year's <laughs> change in the podcast, yeah. well, <clears throat> Sanford was a... A strong advocate for British Israelism through C. A. L. Totten. He actually advertised mm-hmm. Totten's work, right? <clears throat> well, Totten was on the ver on the cusp of whenever British Israelism was converting to identity, and so I began tracing these trails. How does that lead to Sharon Orphanage? And mm-hmm. I'm starting to go through all these pieces and. Again, I have all these scattered pieces, and your work was the glue that kind of tied them together. <laughs> the biggest of which, which is another shocker that I'll give you, yeah, Gerald Burton Winrod, who's a name that I'll I'll be continuing mm-hmm. yeah. to mention. He's yeah. this is a yeah. infamous character in the United States. He was known as the Jayhawk Nazi, the Kansas Hitler. He was an avowed oh Nazi, Pente- yeah. not Pentecostal, but fundamentalist, and he. Okay. He created what was called the Defenders of the Christian Faith. Um, William Jennings Bryan, who mm-hmm. you're familiar with mm-hmm. that name, the Snow Yeah, Scopes of course, very this. much. Yeah, yeah. Still, yeah. He he went on this final campaign right before his death, and he said, "We are the Defenders of the Christian Faith." Well, when he died, Winrod carried his torch, and okay. so he, Winrod became very very popular among the early fundamentalists and created, you know, he's on the board of directors in the fundamentalist leagues. He starts the defenders of the Christian faith fundamentalist group. And you have that connected to, I mean, very key figures like the le- the founder of the Fuller theological seminary. Yeah, yeah, was in the seminary. Things, right? yeah. <clears throat> well, in Los Angeles at the Angeles temple, Amy mm-hmm. simple McPherson, when she gets too sick to carry on her duties as pastor, mm-hmm. she has Gerald Burton Winrod fill, fill her seat. And I'm You're scratching kidding. my head. What on earth? <laughs> I've got photos of him preaching it, right? Are you and, kidding me? Oh, and so my then I, goodness. Yeah. Charles, who is, he does the podcast with me. We start, yeah. when we realize this, we're like scrambling. Well, anything we can find on this, because another piece of the puzzle that, I had when I had your research, but I didn't understand it all. Mm-hmm. Amy F- Simple McPherson's church was funding the Sharon Orphanage. Mm. And so we started digging into the Angel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Started digging into this, and we find out um, Gordon Lindsay 
was true. Mm-hmm. His yeah. wife was in uh, Amy yeah. Semple McPherson's yeah. Yeah. seminary. Yeah. He was part of Foursquare. His uh-huh. district was right below the North Battleford district. So he would have been in conferences with these people. Uh-huh. And he is speaking at Anglo-Saxon Federation conferences at the time in which those conferences had shifted to Christian identity. So here's a man speaking in the theological seminary that trained Wesley Swift. Mm -hmm. He's working with the key figures in identity, which is (laughs) the, um, you know, the Anglo-Saxon Federation. Yeah. He is there, you know, Branham, like Branham claimed to have accidentally stumbled onto Pentecostalism, he claims this whole thing with the Sharon Orphanage was kind of accidental too. But as we start piecing together the timeline, we see the clan has gone underground. They are right immediately prior to its formation is whenever Gerald L.K. Smith and Rory Davis are out in Los Angeles, where the Angelus Temple mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. You've got all of these things coming together, and the Klan starts this initiative to create fronts in various ways that are unsuspecting to the government, one of which is orphanages. And Roy Davis and William Upshaw, the congressman, created this financial scheme called the Usher Davis Foundation, which was an orphanage funding the Klan out in California. I want to say it was just a few weeks prior to the establishment of the Sharon Orphanage. So all of these pieces are kind of connected. I cannot say directly that they Mm -hmm. influence one another, Mm -hmm. but look at the number of pieces that are in this puzzle that are right in the same area at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, you almost wonder, it's almost impossible that some of these people did not see each other. When you're talking about individuals that are in the same conferences, uh, you know, denominational district conferences, it's almost impossible that, you know, there's, there's no kind of connection per se. You're talking also, what, what's fascinating is that this year you're, you're looking at weaponized religion and, uh, weaponized Christianity, religion, and it fits very well with, I I know that, you know, this is really a a topic of great interest for me because of my work on spiritual warfare, Uh, but how it, it, you know, you see it emerge. And and if you remember when I was talking about the latter rain, uh, how some of the you know, some of the key things that emerged out of the latter rain, of course, were ideas that have been promulgated by uh, Franklin Hall, his prayer and fasting book, which was very, very popular, uh, very popular amongst uh, the healing evangelists, extremely popular with the people of the latter rain, like Brenham and Franklin Hall stuff <laughs> together be- it became like the, the kind of catalyst that that really kind of uh, uh, you know sparked every, a, a lot of what we see uh, with the latter rain uh, ideas of laying on of hands of transference of spiritual gifts um, uh, of course the ascension gifts uh, the fivefold ministry idea of uh, evangel- you know apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers and the biggie, which makes a lot of people react and a lot of people that don't see sometimes the connections with what is actually uh, happening now with the type of, I would say, triumphalist and supernaturalist language that is, atta- that, that is attached to the idea of dominion, the idea of manifest sons of God, which was something that Brenham also <laughs> mentions like he talks about this which is he didn't invent this by the way because this is these are things like when you dig up and i i did some work archival work on terms of uh in terms of you know the work with parham and and um parham uses this language very very early on the end the end of the 18th uh, the 19th century beginning of the 20th century he uses this stuff in some of his publications the idea of manifest sons of god the idea of the overcomers which are are similar similar terms which which really can be tied to the notion of the you know the superior race all of this uh, you know idea that you know supernatural 
uh, groups of Christians in the end times that will become this this supernatural army of God that will uh, bring about dominion and exercise their authority. Um, can you can can you speak a bit about Parham here? I'm I'm, I'm curious of 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 uh, your take on you know this connection, especially this idea of manifest sons of God, how it ties in with the latter rain, and eventually how it spills into you know the kind of what I call charismatic dominionism, with its emphasis again on ideas of Joel's army or you know end times supernatural endowed Christians that will. Uh, eventually, you know, exercise dominion according to God's will. Yeah, the manifest sons of God has been a heavy concept that we focused on during the last year's podcast. As we're trying oh. to understand it, we actually, yeah. um, <clears throat> we realize Branham is not the inventor of it, but yeah. the the biographies also have it incorrect. They place his learning of it, you know, well into after the latter rain started, we can go back to the, some of the earliest recordings and we can see those mm -hmm. themes existing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at first I thought, you know, Branham's version of manifested sons of God, I ironically are almost the same exact, even some of the same verbiage that is used by Wesley Swift and Swift mm -hmm. predates Branham in some of these things. So we see what I've come to conclude is it's a lot of cross-pollination. Yeah. It's, it's not really that one single person came up with this. This was mm -hmm. These men were in the same conferences, in the same groups, and <clears throat> my method of research is a bit unusual in that I put things together into a chronology, and I don't care where the information comes. It, mm. I, I, in fact, a lot of really good information I've got <laughs> atheists, and I use you know I, I do Christian themes. <clears throat> but yeah, if what they yeah. say is true, I'm I go for I I take the pieces of truth and yeah, I just yeah, I collect yeah. them and the random facts. I don't know how the facts facts fit together. Yeah. Put them chronologically, and I go through and I'll write a book for for example this book, Weaponized Religion from yeah. Lateran to Colonia Dignidad. Oh. When I discovered that. Branham's campaign manager, after Gordon Lindsay kicked Branham out, basically. Yeah, of course. Of healing. Um, Branham's campaign manager was the adopted cousin of Adolf Hitler's minister of defense, Werner von Blumberg. Oh, oh, and then I learned <laughs> that the, they were working directly with Richard Nixon. And Nixon eventually staged a covert World War III in South America, and the, the military version of the CIA, which is called the DIA, had embedded themselves in a William Branham cult compound in Chile called Colonia Dignidad, which was referred to by Germans as the colony, because as a Nazi escaping into Argentina, you first landed into the William Branham message cult compound called Colonia Dignidad, which looked like this little Amish community at the top on the surface and underneath mm -hmm. had this whole military array of bunkers and tunnels. And they, they had set up the, you know, the similar to the DIA here, they set it up in Chile, taught them how to do the espionage. And they had something like, 50,000 bugs planted in politicians to entertainers to, all over the nation operated from this place as a headquarters and a training facility. When I learned all this and realized this is weaponized religion, I, I did write the book. Mm -hmm. But as I go through the chronology, I realized that now that I've went through it, now there are pieces that I understand that I didn't understand when I wrote the book mm -hmm. and I go back through a second time and a third and a fourth. Mm -hmm. We're getting ready this year, um, one of my researchers that helped me on the Davis research, we're starting over and going through a, another pass because of this weaponized religion understanding. Now that I understand what this was and what it became, we, we realize that the impact that this has had not only on Americanized Christianity, but also American politics mm -hmm. is significant. Mm -hmm. And the people in it, like, most of the people, when you study William Branham, they won't tell you that Richard Nixon 
was working directly with these guys, and even to the extent there are Branham sermons named after initiatives that Nixon gave Branham. <laughs> We've identified. Oh my goodness! It's, are you serious? <clears throat> my goodness gracious! It, it's it's a crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> it, 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 it's like. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I wow. Wow. It, and it's and, crazy it's, stuff. and you know that and it's hard to write about these things. Would you say John that it's very difficult to write these things about these things even without even us sounding conspiratorial. You know, like Absolutely. like it's almost like because this is something, you know, like my book that I just came that just came out. One of the comments that came out from uh uh, you know, an interview that uh, was uh, published recently in Salon uh, was that the person uh, was saying, you know, one of the things, like when you talk about the NAR, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, there are now today neo-charismatics uh, or Pentecostals that have been, you know, involved with with C. Peter Wagner and all of these people from from the beginning of what we understand to be the NAR, at least in the in the American context. And they kind of want to whitewash, in a sense, the history. They want to say, no, we weren't part of this, the NAR, the way it's pictured or it's it's portrayed. It's 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 portrayed like this boogeyman, underground dominionist movement that's trying to conquer the world. It doesn't exist. You know, they kind of want to uh, delegitimize people that are actually working on this. Um, having them also almost sound like conspiratorial, you know? And and the person was saying, you know, the way that, that Andre managed to write this book is how do you write about a conspiracy in a non-conspiratorial <laughs> way? You know, it's like, it's like it's very difficult to do that because people think like, what is this? Like this is coming out of anywhere. And this is why it's important. I think what you said about how, you know, we can't, always trace a perfect lineage between ideas you know we can't like okay he knew it before and it, it like he read that person and it's because of that person that we get we can't always do that but we can see that there are parallel ideas that we can see that you know in, at a particular time there are particular individuals that are in contact with each other that they talk that they read each other we, we don't necessarily have all the details about that, but these ideas circulate and they cross pollinate, like you say. And I think that's, that's what we need to show. Um, we, we can't like, we can't pretend these ideas, uh, have not been rebranded in a way that, you know, that makes them sound a bit different, but at the core, it's essentially the same thing, you know? So I, I, I was wondering if you feel that way sometimes. You know, people will say, you know, <laughs> my goodness, are you are you into a conspiracy yourself? Or because it, it, it's hard to write about these things because people think, you know, and 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 this is what we're faced with. You know, when I talk about this stuff to people, people think that people that are engaged in this stuff don't really believe it. They just they just use it for the for the sake of power or whatever, you know, they don't really believe in spiritual warfare. You know, it's just, it's just rhetoric. It's just this and that. And the reason why they say that, John, it's because for them, it's ludicrous. You see, for them as individuals, it's just crazy to believe that. So it's impossible for a person to actually believe that because for them, it's crazy. You see, for them that judge others, it's crazy. So it's not true. They don't believe that. So people become the measure of everyone else. You see, they, those that are critiquing <laughs> that, they think that everybody else thinks like them. But it's not true. You were part of this, you know, uh, movement for many years. And you believe this, like you, you adhered to the message, you believed it, you embraced it, you thought it was true. You didn't pretend like it wasn't true. You thought it was true. At one point in my life, I, I went to, you know, I was a Pentecostal too, and I had, I engaged in, in some of these types of practices of spiritual warfare and things like that. And I was sincere in what I was doing. I believed it, you see? So, you know, it's, it, that that's what's a bit, sometimes frustrating as scholars 
And even like as academics, because sometimes they're going to say, my goodness, is this really academic? Like, are you nuts? Or <laughs> I don't know if you've encountered any kind of thing like that sometimes, you know, you're, you're kind of, what do you want to say? You know, it's, it is, it is what I'm saying, but you, you think I'm, I'm conspiratorial somehow. You know, I grew up in a world where it was black or white that you know cult the cult mindset is black yeah, or white there yeah, is no gray yeah, right yeah. i were i was yeah. told things like you'll know these you'll know them by the company that they keep referring to the enemy the outsiders mm. and how if somebody is mistruthful you can't trust them at all because if they're lying to you about one thing they'll lie about another and god hates liars you know yeah. so i was raised with all of these fundamental concepts which have ironically helped me in in a very weird way because once i started connecting these dots and realizing that when you peel back the rug and you see the dirt that swept underneath there's mm -hmm. some <laughs> these are some very bad people right mm -hmm. and I was accused of being a conspiracy theorist far and wide when I first started this, hmm. but I handled it incorrectly. I would discover things like William Branham's working with the guy who became the Imperial Wizard for the Ku Klux hmm. Klan. He's mm -hmm. I've got his picture right here. Well, they would, you know, they would say this is conspiracy theory. No, he's not part of this. And me saying it is not good enough. Me showing a picture of it is not good enough. What I have done, whenever I write a book, I have taken it so far to extremes because what we have to do is rewrite history that has been written yeah. incorrectly. So whenever I have a footnote, I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. half, half of my page. <laughs> half the page. Half the page is the footnote. Yeah. yeah. What I do is yeah. I, I will give yeah. you the exact quote where it came from. And so you'll get not only the reference, you'll get the actual quote. You can go read the quote yeah. itself. And yeah. in this, over time, you, what you're establishing is truth. It doesn't matter who yeah. John is, what John says. What mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at the reference, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, over time, it probably took, I don't know, seven years. Now at this point, if I mention William Branham was working very closely with high-ranking members of the Klan, mm -hmm. now those who defending <laughs> defending Branham will now say, well, you can't have that. That's guilt by association. It doesn't matter oh, if yeah. he's working. So yeah. <clears throat> we have correctly established now that Branham is working with Klan guys. It, it may take me five or ten years, but... The things that I've just mentioned to you about Nixon and the Nazis mm -hmm. and the colony, mm -hmm. I'm working with scholars in Chile who are working in, you know, they're in the university right next to this place. Yeah. So they yeah. have given me now the government documents. We know that William Branham, when he went with his adopted cousin of Warner von Blumberg, when he went with this, this guy who was... Mm -hmm. uh, what was it? Freire William T. Von Blumberg was his name. Mm -hmm. He was also on the board of directors for the family cult. I can't remember the oh. official name, but the one in Washington, yeah. right? The, the guy yeah. that's yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, helping yeah, yeah, the senators. Yeah, yeah. He is also yeah. on the board of directors of theological seminaries. So this guy is well-connected, and he's, he's a fundamentalist leader and homosexual at the same time which mm. goes against all of the standard. He doesn't even believe mm -hmm. what he's saying, right? Mm. He is the one who connected Branham to uh, Paul Schaefer, who was the head of the Colonia Dignidad cult. Paul Schaefer was William Branham's head of security when in Germany. And because we have this on record in the government documents in Chile, now I have a government record that I can source, and I'll put it in the book, right? Mm -hmm. As, as mm -hmm. we go through this, what we're doing is we're establishing facts of truth that cannot be denied you can if i were mm -hmm. to give an opinion you can deny my opinion but that yeah. is an established fact and yeah yeah the nixon i've got a photograph of william branham in the convention with nixon so it's kind of <laughs> with with oh my yeah, goodness and nixon his yeah. speech here here's what happened and i i won't give you all of the highlights it's in mm, the book yeah, but yeah nixon was wanting to this was when he was vice president. He was working with these guys at this national prayer breakfast and gave them the initiative that we need to use religion 
to instill a psychological warfare against communism. And he's speaking to these guys who are Christian identity leaders. When they hear the word communism, they think Jewish conspiracy. So mm. it's weaponizing the wrong people. Nixon himself didn't even realize he's doing this. Mm. He's weaponizing the bad guys in the nation. So they took it and ran with it. But to your point, what do you do about the conspiracy theorist? My, my point is I just continually release facts. Mm. And if you follow my mm. website or my YouTube site, mm. Mm. you'll see even sometimes it's a two-minute video. Here's a fact. And over time, as the facts yeah. are established, now you have a, ground, a foundation of truth that you can build truth upon. Yeah, yeah. You can actually write history in a proper way because what you said about, you know, the accusations of guilt by association, you we have that now because more and more in my world, like when we've been doing work around the NAR, for example, um, and I've co-written a, a couple of pieces with, uh, you know very well, Frederick Clarkson from uh, Political Research Associate. You know, uh, one of the first pieces that we co-wrote together, there was a reaction by uh, Michael Michael Brown, who is a uh, kind of a Pentecostal podcast star, or whatever. I don't know what you know, uh, teacher and uh, very popular in those circles and uh, liked the article, but he said, you know, you should talk about charismatic, not NAR stuff. It's not, it doesn't exist, you know, so telling us it doesn't exist, but <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about? It doesn't exist, you know, and guilt by association, this idea that because someone has been close to someone else or, oh, you're, 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 you're accusing us of being part of this, but yeah, you supported these ideas, you know? It's like these people are at a time where they they see that they lost control of what they instigated at the beginning. They were all for C. Peter Wagner, you know, ap Apostolic Networks, NAR, all of that. They were all for that. This is great. This is great stuff. Uh, even embracing the type of dominion ideas that come out of the Coalition on Revival with Gr Jay Grimstead, and they had these documents on their website, and you know, and now things are going bad politically. You see, they, you know, many of evangelicals supported Trump, and they don't want to be identified with with these people, so they're backing out. You see, and they're trying to rewrite their involvement. With that, they are saying, no, we were really always against that. But you were there. You supported that. You were part of the thing. Uh, admit it, at least. You know, own it. Be <laughs> man up, like we say. <laughs> and just admit you were wrong. Admit it. That's already half the, 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 the damage that is at least, uh, I don't know, pardon, but at least, you know, you, you, you're, you're able to say, okay, you know, I was wrong. I was part of this. You know, people are not perfect, uh, but that's that's what we're encountering a lot. And, um, you know, with the work on the NAR and what I'm very happy about now is there's more media attention around these questions. People are more aware of ideas about dominion, uh, spiritual warfare. I've given a lot of interviews where, you know, I wouldn't never imagine, John, like three, four years ago, being able almost to, in a course, like in an interview, almost give a course on, on spiritual warfare. And the interviewer re reproduces it in his article. Like I would have never, never imagined that like four or five years ago. But now they're worried. You know, American public, I think, is very worried with the situation, the political situation in America. And they, they see how... Many of these neo-charismatic Pentecostals associated with this idea of new apostolic reformation have been instrumental in pushing for Trump in 2016 and are still very much instrumental with trying to have him back in the White House. But the problem is they don't understand why, first of all, why would he, they support this guy? They don't understand the theology that underpins everything that they're doing. They don't get ideas about dominion 
and the profound implications that this has for American democracy and for pluralism in, in American society. But you see, that's where we come in. That's where as scholars, we have to take advantage of this opportunity that's given to us and and speak out, and I'm I'm very very happy, John. I I can't say how much I'm happy to have connected with you, and for this opportunity that you've offered me to have this very very, uh, you know, laid back chat <laughs> about your work, about what I do, uh, even help you know helping me understand what you've been doing and how, and 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 you know what what really amazes me is that. You know the because we we don't get a lot of feedback about things we do sometimes you know like these these podcasts that i did I, these video vlogs that i did uh how they could have been useful for you for me that that is amazing i i it's it's my reward you see hearing you <laughs> say that is my reward so i want to thank you for that john well that's great and thank you for putting it out there you know one of the things that you said what we see now politically they realize their problems mm -hmm. with it and so now mm -hmm. they're examining <clears throat> that's another way in which you get unbranded as a conspiracy theorist recently mm -hmm. this is probably another surprise to you i don't mm -hmm. know if you you may know this or not but we connected William Branham to Jim Jones and, you know, the Jonestown mm, Massacre. I heard about that. We, and we I heard people, actually people really uh, being impressed with the work that you've done. I've seen comments from oh, wow. people being extremely impressed with, with that connection that you made. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> we, and, uh, you know, we even have, we even have letters directly connect. Anyway, yeah. one of the ways in which truth gets grounded and you get overturned as this conspiracy theorist there was another jonestown event just last last year in uh, march in kenya there yeah. was a i don't know if you're familiar with this the shock yeah, yeah, massacre yeah, right? yeah, 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 they yeah, discovered yeah. all of these tracks of william branham and so as newspapers are scrambling to find okay what is this thing that they found covered what who is this william branham guy well now because we've established all of these we've got podcasts we've got all these two minute yeah. videos they were able to find the research and wait a minute, this guy who had death by starvation <laughs> came from a sect that or originally <laughs> was created by a guy who had the fasting and prayer book, right? This was the yeah, yeah, movement, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. what happens is no longer is it conspiracy theory when you can tie an actual event to an actual mm. fact. So by publishing the research and the history, mm -hmm. it makes everything, even for the journalists, whenever an event happens, now they have... Ac yeah. actual information to go off of so yeah 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 i'm, yeah, I'm trying to do <laughs> like you did for me i'm trying to do for the next guy so we, <laughs> we pass the torch forward right <laughs> no your website is just phenomenal i found stuff on that like i like mind-blowing stuff really really i i i really encourage people to to visit your your work and and to follow your work and uh you've um I, I, I'm stunned with the genealogical historical work that you've done. Uh, what you've shared with me today is uh, mind blowing, <laughs> literally mind blowing. <laughs> but I can see connections with some of the stuff that, you know, like Parham and others. And it's, 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 uh, wow. It's, it's just wow. That's, that's the only thing I could say. Well, and to blow your mind even further, because we're <laughs> we're putting this into a podcast, right? So we, we yeah, have yeah. I can't tell you all the surprises right now. We we've yeah, got more to come. So Yeah. <laughs> this, this has been great fun. If our listeners want to find your information, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me, of course, there's my YouTube channel. It's very easy. You type in Andre Gagne, uh, and you have a bunch of videos there uh, that you know uh, very well, uh, John. Uh, you can find me also on uh, X, formerly Twitter. Uh, so you type in my name, Andre Gagne, uh, and you'll find me just in the search. You'll, you'll be able to find me. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a sub stack also, but I don't publish enough. I just, I just recently added something on the Manifest Sons of God, uh, a bit of an expansion of what I had written with, um, 
with um, uh, Fred Clarkson, uh, but I should get more on it. It's just that uh, you probably know this. I'm also chair of my department at Concordia, so <laughs> that's that's an administrative position. Uh, so it takes it takes a lot of uh, time uh, to take care of a faculty and and give a vision and take care of administrative duties. So I'm I'm less present than I was in terms of even creating new videos and stuff like that. But I got to get back to it because I have a lot of fresh new ideas, things that I want to explore. And, uh, you know, my discussion with you today has been, uh, you know, an inspiration and it will uh, propel me probably <laughs> into, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, very interesting um avenues of research uh, that I need to delve into. And I will uh, definitely get my hand on on uh, your latest, the latest book that you just showed me. This is the le the latest one that just came out? It the is. The Weaponized yes. Religion? Okay. Yes. So I, I have to get that, definitely. And, and this one, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's it's kind of thinner than the rest of them because once I, realized, <laughs> once I got towards the end of this, yeah. I realized – you know, this goes even deeper than this book. Yeah. I'd, at the time I began this, I did not fully grasp the connection between British Israelism and the cult that we escaped, mm -hmm. how it converted to Christian identity. So this is an intermediate book, but it does give you the history of Colonia Dignidad, and yeah. I've, I've got the Nixon information in here, so you'll get a good bit of that. And um, but You'll like probably said, expand that? You'll probably re-edit it or expand it l later I, on? Is actually, that something I'm, that you're playing? Actually, I'm thinking about having a follow up, follow up um, companion book. That this is a okay. story that, in of itself, it is complete. But there's a bigger yeah. picture that created this story. So I want to dive mm -hmm. into the bigger picture. And, okay, uh, that's that's where I'm headed. I've actually started the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my goodness. All right. So many things. So going thank on. you. Well, thanks thank for, you for doing having this. Me. We'll have to do it again sometime, either on your platform or mine. I'm I'm happy to yeah, for, happy to join. For sure. You. For sure. It would be great. Well, if you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william branhamorg For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the Healing Revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. 